Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to have a chat with somebody who I think is one of the simply just one of the greatest artists that Scotland has ever produced uh, and somebody who should be celebrated and valued. Um, somebody who, who draws like an angel, who's an astonishing painter, and on top of all that is an absolutely brilliant playwright. Uh, this is a man who was part of a group of people who were in the vanguard of creating uh, the cultural landscape, if you like, of Scotland that allowed so many of the rest of us uh, who came later um, to have a career. Uh, he is exactly what an artist should be and is also, above all else, a walking work of art himself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Byrne. All for you? That's right, all for you. John. Here. <laughs> Where were you born? Born in Mill Street in Paisley. Right. 16 Mill Street. And what was that like? It was very nice. It was up a close, and we had a buffer wall uh -huh. in front of the close to prevent shrapnel <laughs> flying up the close from the bombing. Yes. Uh, and there was a, a big mill, a thread mill at the end of our road. Uh -huh. Hence Mill Street. <laughs> it's now completely gone. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, it's now police headquarters. Okay. At Paisley, very busy station. Indeed. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and your parents? Who were they? What were they like? Uh, my parents, uh, uh, my father came from Govan, Patrick, and my mother was a nurseryette at the Most Part Cinema in Cardonald. Yes. And so they hated Paisley. It was the only, <laughs> the only they got a house in Paisley when they got married in Moncrief Street, uh -huh. uh, and then moved to Mill Street. And the Creef Street in Paisley. So there were aliens in Paisley, with no relations in Paisley at all. No right. aunties, uncles, cousins, or anything. And was there anything about them that was, uh, for want of a better word, arty? Uh, nothing whatsoever. No. <laughs> Except my, my grandmother, my mother's mother was a lace maker in Carrick Macross, uh, or Cross McGlen, Carrick Macross Lace, right. in Ireland. Okay. And her mother and father had come across. Uh, just at just the turn of the century, uh -huh. uh, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my father's father was from uh, Ireland, and his mother, my father's mother, was from South Queensferry, but her parents were from Ireland. But there was nobody there that drew, there was nobody there that painted well, or wrote. Well, I tell you, uh, my, well, my uncle Pat, my mother's brother Pat, was in uh, stationed in Burma during the Second World War, and he used to send their uh, letters with cartoons on them. You know, a letter to my mother, and there would be a wee cartoon of it uh, with elephants in it and stuff like that. And I thought, and uh, that he had drawn them. I was told, in actual fact, I was told he had drawn them. So he was a wonderful artist. They all came, and then uh, I discovered many, many years later that you could buy these at the post office. <laughs> <laughs> you were with the cartoons ready and you just put it in your writing. Right. <sighs> so they were counterfeits. It was, it was, a, it was a life of uh, tragedy. Yes. You know, and disappointment. <laughs> you know. But he was still a great guy. Yeah. But there was, no, there was, no, there was, there was nobody who... Was there anybody there who spoke about art? Was there anybody there who said, you know, Let's go to the library and get a book of Michelangelo. Well, yes, no, I was, I was taken to the art gallery in Paisley a lot, and then when I was Is there an art gallery in Paisley? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> there is an art gallery, but very good, <laughs> very good art gallery. <laughs> and uh, we went to the library all the time, and the wireless was on constantly. Yes. And uh, so they were. Uh, oh. 
I remember. No, I can't even tell you that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, um, when could you always draw? I could always draw. I can't even remember when I started drawing. So I there isn't. A, draw. You can't remember a time when you couldn't draw. No, because my mother said I was drawing in the pram. <laughs> right. Which, which I, I could believe. Yes. I don't ever remember starting to draw. It was just natural. So was the? How did that? Did they supply you with materials? Yes. They, yes. Took me Your to parents me, did? Yes. They took me to Mr. Brown's, uh, who was an artist colourman in Paisley. An artist what? Colourman. What's that? A supplier of... Uh, paints. And paints yeah, and yeah, brushes okay. and stuff for artists and paper and stuff. Right. Who was in the back Snedden in Paisley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in one of the arches. The back Snedden, is that the, the, is that, is that, the, name of the is, is that a thing? A Snedden? <laughs> The Snedden. <laughs> Sorry, it's a word that has escaped me. A Snedden? What is a Snedden? I have no idea what a Snedden was. <laughs> but this was the back of it. <laughs> OK. Oh. <laughs> and right. Mr Brown, I remember she took me in, and I would be eight or nine. I couldn't eat, I could just see over the counter. Yes. And he was a wee man, he wore his bonnet. He wore his, his suit and his waistcoat and his bonnet to serve you. And uh, we went in one day, and, and the previous visit, he'd asked to see my drawings. Right. So my mother took in a few drawings to show him, and, he, and, he, and asked for some brushes, and they brought the brushes. Then he looked at the drawings and went, oh, keeps them back. So he took the brushes back and went through the back, and he brought out me, uh, brought my mother out, sable brushes. Right. And laid them on the counter. Right. And she said, he said to my mother, Mrs. Byrne, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> there I was. <laughs> so, so that was somebody then who recognised your talent at that yeah, age. Yeah, I did. I mean, it was obviously uh, a And encouraged that. And the family encouraged it as well. Yeah, no, all the time. Right. Yeah. I'd like to know that how, when you went to art school, which uh -huh. was like in 1958, yeah. Glasgow School of Art, the yeah. smouldering Glasgow School of Art, <laughs> um, what, what was, what did you think would happen? What did people think when they went? I remember once you told I was always interested. You told me once what the other <laughs> students were like in 1958. You said they were guys with pipes <laughs> and That's cardigans. Right. Everybody had a pipe. Everybody had a pipe. Including certain ladies as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pipe ladies. No. But what was the intention? If you went to art school, what were you going to be? Were you going to be an artist? I was, I, was going to, I was determined to be an artist. Right, so, how, okay, well, let's uh, rewind that back. How yeah. do you get from being from the man of the sned and the back of the sned, <laughs> giving you disabled brushes, to deciding to be an art artist? I, I always wanted to be an artist. In fact, I remember my mother telling me about the, the insurance man, Mr. Stevens, I remember his name, who came round the doors to collect your insurance every week, like one in nine a week or whatever it was. Uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, who wore a soft hat. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean something that we don't understand? I, because that's what you called it in those days. It was what? It, it wasn't a bonnet, it was a soft hat. Okay, I got a like trilby a, affair. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. a soft hat. And he always took off his hat in the house. All and right. he was invited in. And uh, my mother went into the swivel drawer and got out uh, insurance books, pearl insurance, and uh, paid her one in items or whatever it was. And uh, he, he noticed the drawings and he says, uh, what was, what was Ian? Ian was called in those days. Why was that? Uh, because it was a, I was delivered uh, by a, a, a Highland midwife and, and baptised John and in uh, admiration of this midwife's help, my mother called me Ian the Gaelic for John. All right, okay. You see? And uh, he says, what is your boy going to do? I was about 12 or 13 or something. He says, wants to be an artist, he wants to be an M.A. Because <laughs> that's what my mother thought was a master of art. <laughs> and, and Mr. Stevens, I remember he put her right and says, no, that's, no, Mr. Byrne, I'm sorry to disabuse you of that, but that's a, a degree in whatever, English or an M.A. in English or whatever. Right. So that was a flummoxed <laughs> as to what to do. And I remember asking my father, I went to work, uh, having left school, having built out a school mid-term in fifth year, and went to get a job. And I got a job as a slab boy. 
And there was a woman that worked in the design room of Stoddard's and the orders of the... So just explain what that is, what being a slab boy is. Well, it's, I, I thought it was uh, normal for uh, to grind up colours for carpet designers. So this is in a and carpet factory? A carpet, uh, carpet factory, a uh, big factory, and then there was office buildings, right. including two design rooms. There were 67 designers, carpet designers, right. in 1957. Around about 1957, I got a job there, and uh, I was given a dust coat, and uh, I had to grind up powder colour uh -huh. for the and dish it for the designers. Okay. And then I discovered later on there were no slab rooms in any, in any other carpet factory at all. They just bought their jar, the, the, the paint and ready-made in, right. in jars. But they were sadists or something. Like that. They liked <laughs> yeah, in <laughs> popular sadists they were. But uh, you wanted, but I'm, I'm interested to know if, if you wanted to be an artist. We had no idea how we go about it at no, all. No, but, but what kind of artist did you want to be? How, who did you think you would be? I wanted be? to be an artist with a smoke. <laughs> 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 and a berry. And going. We like for a cartoon. To, well, I don't know what it, what it no, was. But I mean, did you, did you go and, you know, did you look at. Rembrandt or Vermeer or Degas or something, no. I think that's who I want to be like. Well, I did. I was sent by a Lady of Lourdes school, primary school, when I was 10. I was sent up to Kelvin Grove on a Saturday morning. Right. On my own, on the tram car from Paisley, uh, right up to Kelvin Grove. You could get the tram car right up there and go off at Kelvin Grove Valley. And you were taken downstairs into a, a basement <laughs> along with other school children, mostly from Glasgow. Yeah. And showing films about artists. Right. So I was well aware of uh, what was going on. Yes. They were showing William Blake and uh, Picasso and all these people in films about Eskimo artists uh -huh. and all sorts of artists. And what of did you think of Picasso? The what? what did you think of Picasso? I thought he was wonderful. Right. Same as I thought William Blake was wonderful. Right. I still do. Why did you think Picasso was wonderful? What did I what? Why did you think Picasso was wonderful? Because he could draw like an angel. He could draw anything. Uh -huh. It was a gifted child, like oh. I was. <laughs> I mean, I was unconscious. unconscious he hadn't been to the back snedding, though. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I thought I glimpsed him one time. Yeah. Upper close, disappearing upper close. Yes. Uh, where were we? No, I was asking about Picasso because he's a kind of... Uh, oh, no, Picasso, he's, there, was he's, a, he's, there was a brilliant film made of Picasso in the 1950s in which we all went from the art school to the Cosmo Cinema, uh -huh. which was just down the, the street in Rose Street. And it was a, a film of him working. And they had a camera that shot up underneath the, the perspex or glass he was working on. You saw the images up here. And that was the first time we'd seen a Flowmaster pen. It was a felt-tip pen. Yeah. 1958. And he was working with a felt-tip pen. Yes. And we got the, the school, uh, the art school shop to get in flow master pens. Right. And they always, they always kind of overflowed because you had to f fill them up with liquid ink and then the felt tip was a big broad tip and they leaked yeah. in your pocket. Okay. You know, so it would turn black in the pocket. <laughs> I should have walked with black patches. <laughs> and while you're at art school, uh, I'm saying like, this is your life now. While you're at art, <laughs> yeah. art school, you discover, well, the world discovers um, rock and roll. Oh, God, I. Well, it had been discovered earlier on. The first time we heard the Elvis was a re total revelation. I can't tell you, can't you? It's impossible to explain to you what it was like when we heard Heartbreak Hotel on the wireless. We'd heard of Elvis, but we'd never heard him. And this noise came out of the wireless. It was fantastic. But what was it like before then? What was the... What was there the, was a the skiffle the... before then. Uh -huh. The skiffle was the, the Vipers, uh, Lonnie Dornigan and all these people. Yeah. Uh, Bob Court did Six Five Special. Yes. But the, the, the best of them were, was the Vipers. Yes. They were the kind of rock and roll. I just because when I was at art school, we went to art school the year, uh, we all turned up looking like Neil Young and hippies with long hair <laughs> and, and flares and all that. But during the summer break, the Sex Pistols exploded no, onto the scene. for goodness sake. So we all came back with peroxide hair <laughs> and leather trousers and the pierced ears and stuff like that. It was like that instant and that fast. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a change like that? And was, did, did the, people... There was, a, there was a huge change, but lots of people went to art school in blazers, school blazers. Right. And I went to art school and I, I cut down American camel hair coat. Right. Black. And I cut it off 
Well, a reefer jacket. Yes. And uh, had, a, had a quiff, All <laughs> and right. a DA. So you were already very, very stylish. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, you could recognize an art, an art student. This is later, of course, but very stylish. 1975. You've got the flares painted. and the carved in. Oh, no, no, that was, well, they'll never come back. They keep trying to bring flares back. <laughs> well, all the God. material was used up for those particular pair, <laughs> I think, there. <laughs> um, so, uh, there you are at art school. Rock and roll comes along. You're very excited by it all. Yeah, uh, but and, everybody was armed with guitars yeah. in the whole of Britain. Yes. Because of the skiffle craze from yeah, 1955. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so we were ready for rock and roll. Right. To play three chords. Right. Which is best rock and roll. And did it influence your work? I mean, what kind of things were you doing at art school? Uh, drawing guitars. <laughs> drawing guitars. <laughs> and bikes, bicycles, racing bikes. I was mad about racing bikes. But you were, fa- I mean, I, I imagine the art school then was fairly classical and rigorous. It was, in its, aye. Uh, yeah. So you had life classes and... We didn't have life classes until second year, and then, and then you went on uh, on a daily life class and an evening class and life classes from third year on. Right. Aye. And what about painting? Painting, I, you could do painting. You were given a, a monthly composition to do at home. Right. And then they got different members of the staff uh, from the upper school to come and uh, review it, you know, the whole of first year. There was four sections in the first year and uh, they would get Wally Armour or someone who was the head of painting to come and do a crit on it. And given that one. you could always draw, was there, was there a point uh, in your childhood when you, when you can remember starting to paint? I mean, was that... A, I I'm always interested in whether they're separate things. Yeah. Whether or, because it seems to me that people... No, the, well, the, the drawing came first and then the painting I painted with watercolours and then the oil painting I hadn't tried until I, I painted that first composition for uh, art school. Right. No, no, but that's quite, before that. But that's quite a complicated medium to work with. It is, yeah. You wanted to see your brush marks. Yes. You know. Okay. Because that seems to be the, all the go then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and was there any particular artist that you were emulating, or were you just finding your? No, I looked. I, I used to get the. I had got all the Daily Express uh, great masters. <laughs> you know, in, in thank in you big, to the Daily Express. In, in book, book <laughs> form. Last for that. Scottish Daily Express. Yeah. If you sent away from there. I think there were a bit five shillings for right. a big uh, paperback. Were beautiful and all the great masters Velasquez, Rembrandt, uh, Picasso, uh, who else? Tintoretto, Titian, everybody. So I was acquainted with them. So were you They're copying what? those? I did you? copy uh, a Velasquez of a black guy. Uh, and that was before I went to art school, so I must have been uh, fairly proficient with the uh-huh. oil painting then because I did a copy of that. Right. And I took it into. Uh, the slab room, and there was a woman there who had done Saturday morning classes and the evening classes at Glasgow School. And she says, "You used to go to the art school." Ah. And I says, "How do you get? How do you do that?" And she says, "I'll get you the forms to fill in to do go and do the entrance exam." Ah. So you just set an exam as well. What was the exam? The exam was over two days, and uh, I remember you used to draw objects, do still life, set up a wee still life and draw that. And uh, I saw a cast drawing, drawing of a, a cast, a plaster cast. Uh-huh. And uh, you used to do a design, sort of spots and sprigs kind of design thing. And then uh, for the following day, you were set a composition, <laughs> one, of which, one of the subjects of which was a windy day. And everybody drew their back green. I remember the that. Still the, a, the thing. That was around for a long time. Pillowcases flapping in the wind. Another one they had was a fallen tree. <laughs> that, was well, that, that, was, that was quite advanced. Yeah, that was good. Um, so once uh, you finished art school, uh-huh. what was, uh, what, when you went out into the world, what did you do? What jobs did you seek? What, how did you, well, how did you be set out to make yourself a professional art- artist? I, I got a, a, we'll get another a, picture here while we're here. Because the man's gone to great effort. Oh, you're missing from that. 
Oh, there's... Uh, no, what happened to that? Tell us about that banjo. That's uh, a, like, a well, strange that's a, picture of a... That's a left-hand section of the Billy Connolly portrait. That's his, the shadow of his finger, his pointing finger, right. pointing at his banjo. And it's lost. Is this why it's in black and white? Yes. Because so that's the only record they have of it. It's eight foot by four foot. I gave the... It was in two sections. Billy Connolly's on the other side of that. Yes. And uh, I gave it to the People's Palace in Glasgow. Right. In perpetuity, because Billy didn't have, had any room enough to have it in his house, and we didn't have room enough in our house. <laughs> so, and the next time I saw it, and I went, no, it's meant to be, they made a postcard of Billy Connolly. Yes. And uh, I says, well, it's, it's not complete unless you do a, a postcard of the banjo to go along with that. And they said, ah. what banjo? I said, there's a panel, there's another panel, and nobody knows where it went. Oh, dear. But, oh. I think it might be in Berlin or in Munich and that guy's oh, flat, full God. of all the... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> full of all the plundered artwork. There's Billy there, that's the other bit. That shows you how colourful and... Uh, yeah. Uh, so what was your relationship with Billy Connolly like? How did that... Uh, it started... Uh, I first met him in 1969. Uh-huh. When... Because uh, I, I worked beside Jim Rafferty in the slab room and uh, he used to borrow the banjo that hung behind... the three-string banjo that hung behind the door of the slab room for his young brother, uh, Gerald, right. as I always knew him, and uh, take it home. And uh, so I've known uh, Gerald, I had known him then since he was eight, and he was playing Cliff Richard on the three-string uh -huh. banjo and singing Cliff Richard songs. And then he... Uh, uh, but he introduced you to Billy... Uh, ah, yes, and then he met uh, Billy... Uh, when he was out, uh, they when Billy was with Tom Harvey uh -huh. as the Humble Bums. Right. And then Gerald joined them, and Tom Harvey dropped out, and Billy did. And they did a, a kind of, it was a show in two halves with Billy doing, because he used to do uh, things in me, funny part in between the songs and everything, and Gerald didn't like that, so. Right. Because it, it put people off. <laughs> people, were, people were laughing too much. So they were still laughing when Gerald would come on and start playing. <laughs> so it was usually, it, it ended up being in two halves, you know. Yeah. And they would sing a couple of songs together. Yeah. And they got to do the first album sleeve. Okay. Uh, the New Humble Bums, it was called, for right. trans, on Transatlantic and Label. Right. Yeah. Um, so to go back when you left art school, what did you do? How did you, how did you earn uh, a living? I got a scholarship to go travel to Italy, and I went to Perugia because uh, Percy Bliss, uh, the director of the art school, had been to Perugia, and he sent me to the same pensione right. as he had stayed at in Corso Garibaldi, Pensione ah. Leonardi. And uh, I was there for about seven months and came back. What did you do? I paint, I mean, now painting. Oh, I'm but it's like a scholarship to sit in uh, the sun uh, and draw and, and... And get drunk a lot. Oh, OK. <laughs> I think because the Italians are used to drinking wine and stuff like that, they would usually have a glass of wine. They put two crabs on the table every night. There was a whole lot of other students, vet students, because Perugia is a big... Uh, a place where there's a big vet school. Right. And they were all veterinary, studying to be a veterinary... Or veter or vets. vets, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they put a red one on and a white, and people would just have a half a glass of wine, and I drank <laughs> both, <laughs> both crabs every night and rolled into bed. So was that a, was, was that a culture shock then? Was that a very, was, it, was, how, it was an enormous culture shock. So did that open your eyes to the world? And uh, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in many ways. But what jobs did you get? What, what how, how did you? Oh right, and I come back, right, and I got a job in STV as a graphic artist. It was right. advertising the paper, so an advert, uh, 22 pounds a week. Uh-huh. 22 pounds a week. It's extraordinary, 1964. So what were your duties? Uh, to draw captions, illustrate captions that were put up on the screen. Right. Between programmes. Okay. And if some broke down, show on the caption. Right. Or to get trailers, a trailer caption for coming programmes. Uh -huh. There's plenty of stuff to do. Right. Funnily enough. And what about, um, did you do any book covers or anything like that? Hey, I did some, I did some for, I did uh, the Kraken Wakes for Penguin. Right. Uh, I was phoned up by Alan Aldridge out of the blue 
and they asked me to do that, and uh, then I did several more, and I couldn't wait till they came out. And uh, uh, but you're conducting your own life as an artist, uh, doing your own stuff, as it were. Yeah, well, while was, doing this stuff too. I to, was to moonlighting as a. Uh, with a stuff, and I sent as many things off to galleries. I don't know how many things I sent off to galleries in London. So were you not? You weren't getting any uh, success. No, I had no success. I remember walking this Cork Street. There were twenty-seven galleries in Cork Street. That used to be the main centre in 1960. Oh God, what, what year would it be? 1960, possibly, uh -huh. or 1959. And I stayed with my pal Peter O'Neill in Harrison. Yes. They lived above a shop in Harles. I know Harles, I know the shop, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very yes. shop. Yeah. And uh, I used to trudge, I, it reminded me, because I saw him recently after about 40, 50 years, Peter, and he says, I remember you caught a bit of, sawed a bit of our skirting board in the lavatory and painted a painting on it, uh -huh. on the back of it, which I did. Yes. And I took it around uh, uh, the galleries in Cork Street, along with some nails. Right. Two, I think I had two two works. Right. They wouldn't even look at that. Nobody wouldn't look at that. No. I bet I've got good skirting boards. It's <laughs> 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 well, well, it was behind the, uh, the lavatory pan. All right, OK. So it was, <laughs> it was invisible. That's good. You couldn't see it too readily. It's all about the materials. Um, <laughs> there's Billy Connor again. Uh, I want to know about Patrick. Yes. I don't know what, how, how, what people in the audience know about you. Uh, or about Patrick. This is a picture of Stephen Campbell, the late, uh, wonderful uh, Stephen yeah, Campbell. Wonderful uh, you were just telling me an interesting thing about that palette. Yeah, well, I'd, uh, I bought, a, 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 a buy odd palettes, and this was a wee porcelain palette, very small, and I didn't use it ever at all. But I thought I would give, uh, I did a drawing of Stephen, and I put uh, the tools of his trade in and the palette and uh, the brush, and I thought, and it looks like a skull. And it does look like a skull. Yeah. And yes. uh, within, oh God, I don't know, 10 months or something, he was dead uh -huh. after that portrait. Uh -huh. um, I, d I was hoping that I would catch a little example of uh, Patrick's work. Yes. Uh, which we, I don't seem to have here. But to, to, to members of the audience who don't know, Patrick was a naive painter uh, of uh, Glaswegian school <laughs> who uh, found favour in the galleries of London he did in the indeed. late 60s, didn't he? Yeah. How, where did... Um, yeah. His name wasn't really Patrick, was it? It was you, really, wasn't it? It was me. But I and took my father's name, and my father had been a busker right. during the Depression, and he was around singing uh, around the back greens of Govan with a guy who played a Melodian. Yes. And... Uh, so I remember that, and, and uh, when I was writing off after I did the, the stuff under the, the desk, when I went back to, I went back to, from STV to Stoddard's as a designer, as a carpet designer. Yes. I was, I was board registered, and I was married with two children, so right. I had to make a living. And I uh, painted a, a little painting under the desk, and uh, I sent it off, because I'd seen an article about the... Naive, naive style uh, of, yeah, of art. Called The Innocent Eye in the Observer Colour magazine. The Innocent Eye. So yeah. you specifically decided to fabricate uh, yes. an artist, create I, an artist. I did, because uh, I, I remembered Cork Street, trudging around Cork Street, and right. none of the buggers would even look at anything. Because so they didn't know in there were shops. And then that's when the penny dropped. Ten years later, it takes a very slow yes. learner. Ten years later, the penny dropped. God, they don't know what they're looking at. So I, did you, I, does that mean then you had, you, had, you had a sort of disrespect for their opinion? Obviously, because they didn't well, like you. <laughs> <laughs> I was in need of their premises, you right. know, in order to sell stuff, because you right. can't sell it in your own country, you can't. So, but, so but what I'm trying to get at is, did, did you actually decide as a plan yes, to try and fool the gallery owners yeah, in, and, and create this fantastical, or, well, not fan, but naive painting? Yeah. Of course, because um, I'd noticed in the article, there were a number of galleries, and I picked out the Porto Gallery, and one was uh, by an abbot in France who painted beautiful still lifes in little baskets, and he was an abbey. And then there was a, an ex-prisoner, John Allen, who painted 
figure it up stop in a naive style. Yeah. And I, you needed a hook like a pop, a good pop song. Yes. You need a hook. Right. So my hook was, I was 72, <laughs> famous Patrick, self-taught, and, uh, <laughs> and really good. <laughs> 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 well, oh, it was really, really long. good because they, they bought it, didn't they? They, they bought it, uh, and my, my wife of the time... Well, you were about to say hook, line and sinker there. I think <laughs> you were. <laughs> yes, I <it> was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got me to confess to the gallery. I would never have confessed. And she said, she was such an honest, upright person. She said, you've got to tell them. You can't uh, deceive people. I said, I, I can't. <laughs> 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 so at what point was that? At what point did you fess up? I mean, 19, what, uh, 1967, I had my first show. You and Patrick had his first show. Pa Patrick had his first show. And yes. I had to confess to the, uh, as a tribute to my wife uh, and, and fess up, as we say. Right. Uh, as Patrick put my hand up. And they said, well, if anybody comes to the interview, don't, don't mention the Glasgow School of Art. And I didn't. Right. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, uh, it was it had a clean, they had a very starry clientele, uh, the Portal Gallery. It was in uh, Grafton Street, which is just off uh, yeah. Bond Street. Yeah. A two tiny place. There was a barber downstairs who never seemed to do any Business. hair cutting. Yes. Very odd. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, it, but it paid off for you being it a did. pantry. Yeah. And uh, you were able to have an exhibition under, under your own name. Yeah. Well, it paid off in as much as the first. I think it was the, the second show in 1968, the second show, uh, I was sent uh, round to David Bailey's for him, he photographed me, which Photograph he did for, right. for Vogue, uh -huh. and interviewed by Marina Warner in a, in a little coffee shop off Bond Street, right. which went and got me a packet of fags, which was very kind of her. So this was, the, the, the 60s were swinging? Yeah, they were swinging. And you were there? Yeah. yeah. In the middle of it? And they had lots of people who bought stuff, including oh, a lot of film stars and never who had an interest in that, but they, uh, they seemed to favour. The, the, the most expensive uh, picture in the 1967, given that this is Mayfair, was £30. Right, and what was that? I can't remember. Uh, it was the biggest one. It's because right. it was bigger than the rest, it was about that size. Yeah, yeah, thirty pounds. Was it on a bit of skirting board? No, <laughs> no, I'd given up skirting board. Right? Yes. <laughs> I was, I was too level. Right. So, how now did you start to um, become a writer? Let me put another picture up here because. All right, I. Ross, the man's gone to a lot of effort to make this all the technology work. Yeah. Is this Patrick? No. No. No, no but it's it's kind of half half Patrick, half me. Yes. Because it wasn't, in as much as it was a. Uh, a wheeze. It wasn't entirely a wheeze. Well, it wasn't it was a lie, was it? It was, a, it, was, it, it was recognisably you, to, to those of us who know, you, you didn't hide your, your gifts. No, no, they were beautifully done. <laughs> it wasn't like a, I could uh, uh, did a crude drawing or anything, yeah. you know. Yes. But they were definitely naive. Yeah. So um, you decide, how did you decide to start writing? Uh, I'd always done wee bits and pieces with. No, what does that mean? I've always done wee bits and pieces. Like, what do you mean? Like little sketches. You mean you know, like like comedy like, sketches? Aye, like that. And you'd interview one another, each other, on Fol your tape recorder. On the tape recorder. And then listen back and fall on the floor, laugh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, little blurbs from the Paisley Express. Uh -huh. Like uh, Fire in Inco Street, Chip Pine Blazing in Inco Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but how do you do, how do you get to that place doing blood in the paper? How you, you, get, you don't just wake up in the morning and you're writing blood no, in the but paper. No, I, I do remember. Uh, I was always at it. Now I, I listened to the wireless a lot, and I would hear. Uh, oh God, what was his? I'll, get, uh, I'll remember his name in a minute. Cyril Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. Doing his odd odds. Yes. And I was tickled by those mm -hmm. and children's and all that stuff, and the McFlannels and all that. It was very entertaining the wireless. And uh, I just naturally did wrote bits and pieces. I wrote them in the margins of sketchbooks. Uh -huh. And I had dropped one one day, or left one in Willie Armour's studio, which is right at the top of the art school. They all, the, all the teaching staff had private studios up there. And he'd shown that, he had a look at it, and he, he read all the marginalia and showed it to Percy Bliss. And Percy Bliss stopped me one day and said, 
laughing. And one said, oh, she so enjoyed her writing. And I said, what? And he says, well, well uh, Mr. Armour showed me your sketchbook in which you had several anecdotes and, and little sketches and uh, write, written things. And he said, wonderful. I thought, well, I thought they were saying, no, because they weren't even public consumption right. at all. So how did you get? So how did you get to the point of writing, say, writer's cramp? How does? Uh, I designed. Uh, Billy Connolly was in a show called The Great Northern Welly Boot Show at the King's Theatre in 1972. Tom Wright uh, it was credited as written by Tom Wright and Billy Connolly, and Tom Wright, who was a poet who lived in Edinburgh, did most of the writing of the script. Uh, and Tom Wright said, "An Abbott." Uh, I was asked to design the programme first and then I escalated into designing the costumes and the sets. And they were all cut out sets that flew in. So you'd never worked in the theatre before that? No, I hadn't. So it was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And Tom Wright said, could you write us? Uh, it was a spoof on, or a satire on the uh, government shipbuilding, having taken over the yard. And this was uh, uh, workers in the Wellington factory taking over the yard. So the, Designed the banana books, right. uh, among others, for the show. And Tom Wright says, Could you write us a wee sketch? And so I wrote the, uh, a parody of the Lord's Prayer for the welly workers right. to say, I can't even remember it now. But it was such a thrill to see it in the, in the, uh, in the drama that was being act enacted on stage. So I thought, I'll do some more. So I you think. just became stimulated by the idea yeah. of, of putting something and on stage. And uh, writer's cramp uh, came about in a notebook, a sketchbook notebook kind of thing, black covers on it. And uh, as I was painting for the Portal Gallery, I was also, because I got so bored, it was like turning out sausages eventually. And uh, I just started writing letters from F.S. McDade, who initially was called uh, James Mavis O'Dowda. Right. And then I changed his name to uh, uh, F.S. McDade. Explain Francis, who, who, who he is. Francis probably. Seneca McDade was a, a, an artist. Francis Seneca. Seneca okay. McDade <laughs> was an artist and writer, and I, I, which I was by that time. And I worked in secret. Never let on I, uh, I was doing this. Right. And uh, started off his, his letters home from school. Miss Kibble's College, Miss Kibble's, the Kibble School in Paisley's a bostel. You've got to do, and uh, Miss Kibble's School. Uh -huh. So you only if you came from Paisley, but anyway. Right. And uh, writing to his uh, stepbrother, Brendan. Right. Dear Brendan. But it was a, it was a, a comic evocation. Yeah, of a absolutely character. comic. And then uh -huh. halfway through, he turns to, to painting, he starts painting. Uh -huh. And uh, the critic, Denim Pantaloni, which I had to think of on the spur of the moment because he said, who is this critic from Barhead when there were the three guys are doing that? And I said, Denim Pantaloni. Sounds good. Simple. And, uh, and it was, uh, and I, I did a, a painting of uh, the, uh, of Christ. And, uh, and he, it, was a, it, was this, uh, it was a painting by McDade and signed by McDade. And the, the Nazarene, lounging on a daybed in jerking and bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> we used to call baseball boots in the, when they come out first were called bumpers, you know, with a big flat sole. Yeah. There was nothing like them. So the there he was lounging there and it made me laugh and yeah. still does inordinately. Yes. It's, it's the funniest painting I've ever seen in my life. Right. You don't see many funny paintings. You don't, no, no. They give you a good no. laugh and you just look at this thing and the expression in his face, yeah. dense. Totally dense. But this was a success, and it, 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 yeah, it, because we put it on. I, I was painting a portrait of the Hamilton Trust, who were four guys, Glasgow, a solicitor, a civil engineer, a guy that had been a, a rear gunner in the Second World War, and who uh, bought stuff for and gave it to galleries, and they commissioned me to paint their portrait. Five five guys, mm -hmm. and uh, I painted that, and from the proceeds of that, I was able to fund the the. Because I kept, I, upon the, the, the production of the, the 1977 Edinburgh Festival Fringe, because it was always going on at Powers, let's do something in the Fringe. Yeah. 
And they would say, aye, aye, enthusiastic, and then forget about it. But yeah. I was the only one that persevered. Yeah. And uh, eventually did that. And then we, we, we get, you, you write The Slab Boys. Yeah. Which is an immense success. And I, well, I, I, read, I wrote it, I wrote it, <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote it. It was going to be a musical at first with Jerry Raffrey writing the songs, but uh -huh. that never came to pass. Yes. And it started off as a 28-page. Uh, I thought it has to be a bit more than that. Because yeah. I'd got the idea of, uh, first time around when I was in the, working as a slab boy, because it was full of, there were two design rooms, as I say, and there were 67 designers, and there were some characters in there, and I thought, I'll write a short story. But I couldn't write a short story, I couldn't use prose at all. So it was half a page. And then later on, having gone to the Citizen Theatre and seen every, slept through every production there. Yeah. Uh, and all the productions were great. It was, it was just I was also buggered uh, working by day and painting by night. Right. I would sleep through it, and, and, uh, and I got the idea, <coughs> and sent it off to Giles Havergal. When it was, this was draft seventeen. I knew enough to, and I had already got got a typewriter. Ah. I don't have it now, but I, I work on a typewriter, mm -hmm. because. If you work on a computer, let me tell you, if any budding writers here working on computers, you'll never get any subjects soap opera. It's all like a, all the computer could write, because you cut and paste. And if you work on a typewriter, you have to take out the page if you want to change a, a line of dialogue or a couple of lines of dialogue, put in a fresh paper, and you correct and, and make it better every time you put in a, a fresh sheet of paper. Trust me. <laughs> Well, it was an incredible success, that show, and changed a lot of things and, and changed my life because uh, you, I think you kind of discovered my, the woman who became my wife, who was uh, Elaine yes, Collins, yes, who was indeed. an actor, who was, uh, who was a youngster that you put in it. And, extraordinary. And who I she was absolutely extraordinary. She came to see us, David Heyman and I. And we'd see David Heyman on the stage. And we didn't know if we could direct or not, but it was the only person that we knew we could ask <laughs> to direct it. And so we had... Uh, uh, casting sessions in the a dressing room of the sets, and uh, 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 Elaine came along, and, and and she did a wee bit for us, and then she went out, and we, David and I said, found her, found her, <laughs> we found her. We well, I'm glad her. that you did. No, no, she said, I, I found changed. her later. She hardly well. changed at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the I, I mentioned that I think one of the amazing things about that that show and, and about your work generally is I think you sort of gave, you, you created a lot of kind of Scottish archetypes that really? hadn't been around. Yeah, well, yeah. I think, you know, well, I mean, Lucille Lane's character is the, is the, is the archetypal <laughs> uh, Nyaf. Yeah. So she's a wee kind of quite, uh, sexy gallus Nyaf right. with a wisecrack and uh, a kind of Glaswegian sort yeah. of uh, young Lorne Bacall. Or, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, we hadn't really yeah. seen characters like that before. Uh, and uh, Billy, of course, uh, Billy McCall, McCall, the late Billy, I know. You know, who, who was absolutely wonderful, was playing uh. a kind of uh, a, 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 a almost James Deany, yeah. melancholic, yeah. lost kind of we had a big, rock and roll we had a big guy. picture of James Dean in the slab room. That was the idol. Yeah, yeah. We all, in Paisley, we saw the, the hoarding, the newspaper, you know, the hoardings in the event. Film star killed in car crash and went, James Dean. Nobody had heard of him. I'd never seen a picture. Rebel Without a Cause then came, uh, no, East of Eden then came to the pictures. Nobody knew in this country who he was. Yeah. Nobody at all. Yeah. And then we saw him in Rebel Without a Cause and we yeah. just all fell in love with him. Yes. Uh, and that was the idol. Yeah. But uh, you're sort of creating these, the, these, the, these, Scottish characters uh, in a Scottish context. Specifically Paisley characters. Well, I would Paisley is myself. so different. It's I such an interesting place, Paisley. <laughs> <laughs> Glasgow, you heard it here. First. Yeah, Glasgow, uh, where my mother and father came from, uh, produces comedians, great comedians. But everybody in Glasgow is a comic. In Paisley, everybody is an eccentric. Everybody. There's a guy called Carson. Is American, who was Tennessee, er, uh, Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee Ernie, <laughs> Tennessee, <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee Williams' lover, right at the Baton Rouge 
university, and he was with Tennessee when he wrote A Streetcar Named Desire, and he moved to Paisley. <laughs> he lives across from the museum, was a wee guy. Wonderful. But why did he move to Paisley? You can't just, you I, can't I, just I, start I never that asked story. him. I never asked so him. So you knew him? Well, I met him. I've just met him. I've just it wasn't met him. just a guy in Paisley who said, I'm Tennessee Williams, <laughs> lama. <laughs> did he have an American accent? He did. <laughs> he did. Did you grill him? No, he's famously uh, <laughs> Tennessee Williams. <laughs> it's it's uh, Paul, I think it was Paul McCartney, said Tennessee Ernie Williams. <laughs> Tennessee what? Tennessee Ernie Williams. Tennessee Ernie Williams. I have to tell you, there was a, a great singer, a country singer in our day, Tennessee Ernie Ford, he was called. And hence the and the, and the Beatles are, are my generation, okay. so yeah. that was funny to us. Of course, and to nobody, and to nobody <laughs> else. It was. I no knew world. it was funny in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you did sort of create these characters that were they were all uh, they were all in my head, lived in my head. Yeah, and come out of my head. But once you saw them on the stage, they sort of created f f for for those of us who were sort of stumbling around trying to find a kind of Scottish identity. Uh -huh. This kind of amalgam. Uh, of of art and rock uh, and patter, yeah, was very very new and fresh, and uh -huh. somehow seemed to be saying to us, "This is this is who you can be." Yeah, this is who you are, and it's magical and wonderful well, and crazy. Certain, and the things they said, nobody else had ever said. Nobody else had ever said, and never ever. I just made them up. Yeah, and I broke language, yes. which I love doing. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, you hear about writers sitting behind somebody in a bus. Nonsense, total nonsense. Yes. All you hear in buses cliches. Uh huh. You know, never just heard. Anyway. Yes. Uh, so you touched there upon. Uh, the, I'm, I'm interested in what your influences are, uh, uh, and uh, I, I wonder what part uh, religion plays in uh, an your, enormous your... part. It's an enormous part of my life. Is it? There was a sacred heart over the mantelpiece. You're and a Catholic, right? Yeah. Uh, Just checking. Because oh. <laughs> I only interview Catholics. <laughs> Peter, you know about this. Yes. And uh, I'm no, I'm no a good Catholic. No. 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 <laughs> funnily enough, no. Yeah. I've never You're a lapsed Catholic. No, I'm not even a lapsed Catholic. Yeah. I can't. You know, I go. We go to mass every Sunday, and I play in the in the band, because I cannot. I have not one response. I can't remember any response. I never could. You know, uh, to the so priest. So what, Alex? What you currently you, know, you you go to church now and play in the band? Aye, yeah. Really? It yeah. I mean, you should all go. Everybody should go to church, because it's very very sociable, wow. and it's great. St Peter's, which was uh, built by the guy. Uh, for Father Canon Gray, who worked in the grass market. And this guy, a Polish guy who built a house in the Grange, was a great friend of Oscar Wilde. And Oscar Wilde knew John Gray, and that's who Dorian Gray comes from, okay. St. St. Peter's in the Falcon Avenue. It's a place of pilgrimage. Oh, yeah. And you don't find Bosey wandering around <laughs> Paisley? Like you that. find... You, you, you'd be... Almost certainly find a Bosey yes. walking the streets of Paisley, yet to this day. So, what did you find? I've always been, in, I, I, I always think the Stations of the Cross is the most yeah. extraordinary. No, there uh, was all, every bit of drama in your life was there before. And if the people theater. don't know about the Stations of the Cross, we have to explain. <laughs> the Stations of the Cross are 14 Stations of the Cross, and there's a, uh, the passage of Christ from his uh, accused uh, and Barabbas is set free right through uh, where he's... Uh, he's every lashed. single moment of his... Yeah, uh, and the carrying of the cross and the stumble of the cross, the, 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 the cloth that was given on by Veronica, yeah. and then the crucifixion and the, the deposition from uh, the cross. Yes. And uh, Picasso was once... The John Richardson was once asked of... You know how Picasso was famous as a communist? And they asked John Richardson, who wrote the, the volumes of biography of Picasso, and knew him terribly well. And uh, they said, was, was uh, Picasso, did he have any connection? He says, no half. He was, uh, you know, asked me, is the Pope a Catholic? Picasso. Any connection to what? Uh, did Picasso have any connection to what? To religion? Yeah. Yeah. He says, he was a great Catholic. 
Right. He was a, an unusual Catholic. Uh -huh. I'm an unusual Catholic. Yes. Very unusual. But do, you, but do you find that there's, a, there's an influence on, on your work? On, in yeah, your painting? because all the drama, there was the drama of, uh, it was pictorial drama at that. There was no, so every that, church was decorated and you have to go to confession. And, and, oh. Cause that, that's Patrick, right? This is a this is a Patrick picture. Yeah, it's a Patrick. Just thing. a bounce, but just in case people don't know, that's that's yeah. the, the naive artist. Yeah, view. that is the naive. It's, it's eight feet by four feet. Pass yourself four fast. Eight feet by eight feet square. Right. Rather. It's nice sitting on scripts. I don't know who that is. And who's this? <laughs> <laughs> who's that? <laughs> who's that? Oh, that's uh, Celie, my uh -huh. daughter Celie. Right. When she was about. Seven or eight asleep. It's absolutely beautiful drawing. Yeah. Who do you uh, rate as a draftsman in the uh, whole history of art? The history of art? Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite? I'm trying to think if I've got a favorite. I've got so many favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, can't even be one of them now. There's so, there are so many, really. And they all draw differently. Uh -huh. And that was a great thing we were taught. We were showing Goya's drawings, Rembrandt's drawings, Delacroix's drawings, Picasso's drawings, everybody's drawings. And every artist then could draw. Yeah. And lots of writers could draw as well. And uh, Angra, I think Angra <laughs> is up there. And this kind of, uh, the reverence uh, that you show for this, uh, for these guys, rightfully so, I think. Um, it's, it's kind of unpopular now, isn't well, it? Well, it's, it's very, very hard to do. I mean, if you, unless you're naturally gifted at it. But in Victorian times, young ladies were taught how to draw and, and did passable drawings, all of them. You know, so it can, can be taught uh -huh. to a certain extent. And there's nobody can draw now in art schools, so they can't teach them to draw. And the, the art of drawing, for the most part, it's, it's never taught. It's not completely lost. But it isn't celebrated in the way that uh, in the recent past, the very recent past, and still today, is to a degree. But as we know, you don't have to draw. It's, it's, and lots of things. I mean, I'm not condemning all of contemporary art, because there are good things, but there, is, there are things that mean nothing, they're meaningless, and, and uh, I don't know. No, I think it's just an interesting, I mean, I, 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 think, you, I think you're an incredible artist, uh, and you should be revered as such. Uh, but I think the world is- I would like is, to be revered. Yeah. Well, you know, with-, oh. with yeah. I think, you know, you, you, you're astonishing, you know, what you do. You know, it's, you, your range of skills is, well, is, it's, is it's, immense. It, um, but it's not a, it, it, ironically, it's not a very fashionable thing to be. It's very unfashionable. It's a very unfashionable thing because not that many people do it. When I was uh, at the outset in 1968, there were six artists in the whole of the United Kingdom that reckoned who earned a living from painting, and I was one of them. There were six. How many are there now? 60,000, 600,000? I don't know. I mean, everybody draws, everybody loves art. You know, I mean, it's a natural thing to love. But the, the amount of labor involved in, I know, yeah. in drawing, yeah. in drawing the way you do. But it doesn't feel like that at all. It doesn't it feel, feel like that No, it doesn't feel labor at all. But it is labor intensive. I mean, you have yeah, to be Yeah, of yeah. course. Oh. Of course, when you, when you look at it and think back on it, but know why you're doing it. I mean, it's, it's a joy to do. And you're wanting to do, I don't know, I, I can't even explain it. Do you draw every day? Yeah. Yeah, I work every day. So that's seven days a week, yeah. from morning to night. Because what's yeah. clear about uh, your career is that you've, you, you, you have a kind of astonishing work ethic. Yeah, uh, but that, that, it doesn't feel like work. It really does. And I'm tired at the end of the day. Uh, and I've been knackered and, and everything. But I, can't, I cannot help doing it because it's so enjoyable to do. It gives me such pleasure. I can't even explain it. How much pleasure it gives me. What about Tutti Frutti? Tutti Frutti, Tutti Frutti. Well, came about by... We'd just come back from Leicester where I'd been a, 
an associate director at Leicester Haymarket. Uh, what, theatre? Yeah, he, yeah, Leicester Haymarket Theatre. Right. Never directed, never get in on apart from one thing. Mm -hmm. And I designed a couple of shows there. But we returned from there to Newport on Tay. Uh -huh. And uh, I think the, the, possibly the day after, within a couple of days of getting back, we were away for a year. And I got a phone call from somebody who identified themselves as Norman... Uh, Stern? Stern? No, it was no. not. It was a, his name will come back to me. But he says, you know Bill uh, has taken over the... And I said, Bill, who? who are you talking about? He said, Bill Bryden. Right. Uh, Norman McCandlish. And he was the assistant in the drama department. He was, he was high up in the drama. He was second to Bill Bryden who were known slightly at STV, we were like ships that passed in the 1964 or whatever it was. So they and say to you, can you do something for the telly? He said, no, he said, uh, could you, Bill would like to meet you after he said Bill Bryden. I said, I love Bill Bryden, there yeah. And he said, would you have lunch with Bill at, uh, somewhere in Edinburgh, and, uh, let's say the Traverse. And uh, I said, yeah. And uh, I came out and I had no idea what he was going to propose. I think maybe uh, Norman McC McCandless had flagged up. It was going to be a... Uh, there were usually six in a, a series, a series of six right. one-hour things. And uh, I went in the arm to the teeth and I said to Bill Bride before he said a word, I said, I want you to do all of them. <laughs> this is it's fine, aye. And I want to send you two at a time and I don't want, I want you to say, I've got the scripts. I don't want you to comment on them, good, bad, or indifferent. I don't want any interference. And that is, and he says, well, there are two things. It has to be called Tutti Fruity, and it has to star somebody you've just seen. And I says, no, I'll phone out with him. All right. And he went, oh, his face fell, and he said, Michael Grade, if they're, they have to be on Michael Grade's desk in, uh, Eight weeks' time from now. So they. I had they, to be called Tutti Free. Right. Eight weeks on Michael Gray's desk, otherwise, you will lose all the money for the, for the uh, commission. So you've got eight weeks to write six hours of television? Yeah. Uh, and I, I laid down the law, and he said, Well, who, do you, who, who can we help? Because, you know, the most famous person in the whole of Scotland and further afield. And you don't want no, I says, no, no, I phoned out rather badly. I don't right. want to write okay. from. So you have to find someone else to be and the I leading said, man. Robbie Coltrane, but his face was totally blank. So how did you know Robbie for those who He had been know. in a panto. Right. <laughs> well he'd been he played Plucky Jack Hogg in the Slab Boys and then he was in a panto at Plucky Jack Hogg. Plucky Jack Hogg. Yes. Because <laughs> he had plucks. <laughs> he was baptized. Yes. Plucky Jack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I got Robbie to play him. And a, a, a panto that Elaine was in as yeah. well, playing Pinky the Punk. Right. And Robbie was playing a cat, <laughs> a very large cat, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew he played key keyboards. Yes. So I, said, I went, Robbie Coltrane, Bill Bride went, sorry, who is that? I went, it's great, it'll be great. And I'll, I'll know who I'm writing for. So. Well, he, he sort of practically gave up there and says, oh, well, we'll go off and do it. Okay. And, um, uh, and Emma Thompson as well. And Emma Thompson, but we saw everybody in the uh, whole of Scotland for that part. Right. And then it was Peter Braun who was the script editor who had no work to do at all, <laughs> uh, suggested <laughs> Emma Thompson. And I'd wow. been at Leicester when Emma Thompson was doing uh, Me and My Girl with Robert, uh, Bob. Robert Lindsay, yeah. 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 And so I had seen her on stage. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh -huh. And they sent, uh, she was on holiday with her mother, Philida Law, in Sri Lanka. Right. And they sent her a script, and she phoned up and said, I've got to do this. Yes. And then she came back from holidays. We, we'd seen everybody beforehand, and none of, nobody was right. And uh, she was, because her mother's Scottish, she had a head start on the accent. Yeah, and it. then she got Liz Lockhead to, to teach her uh, a more West Endy accent, right. Glaswegian, West End uh, accent. So she was wonderful. Great accent. Hi. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? 
<laughs> it is a great accent, I think. It's you up there. Um, what are you working on now? Uh, I have to I'll ask you that because uh, I think, look at this fabulous drawing. Um, it's John, my eldest boy. And this? Who's this? Oh, that's Seely. Seely again. Oh. Seely watching television. Okay. Oh. Oh, I don't know who that. There you are, in your Hello. pomp. Yeah. Um, you've just done the ceiling of the, the King's Theatre in Glasgow. Yes, I, God, how did they think to commission that from me? How did that, how, how did that, what no was idea. that like to do? Did you get up there and do it yourself? Well, I, I, there were six people. I did, I met Rachel Simmons, who was the, uh, working with the architects, and she commissioned it. Uh -huh. She suggested I should do it. And uh, I met Rachel, who I didn't know, and uh, uh, I got back to the house and started it. I drew up a big, I put two bits of paper together and draw, drew a big circle, a bit of string and a, and a, a nail, I think, and drew the circle. I started on it and didn't know what it was going to do. Uh -huh. And then uh, I think uh, the people that commissioned the, the Edinburgh Theatre Trust said, can we bring along, this is 10 days later, and said, bring along people to show them work in progress. And I said, it's finished. They went, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, I got uh, Kevin at the Lyceum, who was a scene painter, who was at that time a scene painter at the Lyceum, to project it, because I didn't know, I, this was flat, and the, yeah. and the thing was a flattened dome. So I didn't know how to uh, produce that on the thing. And he got a series of uh, projectors and stuff, and then worked it all out, because it was very clever, uh -huh. and then drew the outlines. And then he got six helpers, and they worked for two and a half weeks, three weeks, and I went in for the last 10 days and made it sharp, sharp up there, because I knew it had to be very, very sharp. You know how you see things? from a distance, and you go up close and go, oh, it's a mess, it's a mess. No, you have to stand back. There's an old uh, saw of a pin, you know, you, you up close, you can't see it, and then you come back and go, oh. <laughs> no, it had, to be, it had to be sharp as a razor up there as well, otherwise it wouldn't shine from below. So I went up and worked away. That makes me... And the theatre has been refurbished, so there's all the... And they put up an extra platform on top of the... Uh, all the, the scaffolding. Yeah. And you had to then stand in a box to get up to the ceiling. And you got off the box and you, were, you had no idea where you were. <laughs> and it, it, just, it very gently, it was like being on a boat to take quells before you went on. <laughs> but that was a, a new experience for you. I mean, it wasn't it that was you had done something like that before. No, because I'd done a big uh, gable end in Glasgow in oh, 1975. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. And that was on a, one of those thing was that you guide up, and that was about, it must have been 100 feet high. Well, this was 100 feet up, the, the king. Are you secretive about, I'm always fascinated by the notion that, that painters in particular have secrets. I'm that sure they I have. Not, I mean, trade secrets, like, you know, how they get oh, yes, a particular I, blue, or how they do that sky, yeah. or how you get that black that deep. I mean, have you... Yeah. Have you got a wee book somewhere with a, a collection of... No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm not, I'm not a... I'm not a chemist. I'm but a you said when you were anything. doing the... You said when you were talking about painting the ceiling that it had to be really sharp up there oh, know, right, to work down there. So how did, that, you, how did you know that? Because it's common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> and I haven't got any. <laughs> I, I think we're running out of time now, I think. No. Oh, yes, I'm afraid I so. That was just uh, I, I just want to uh, thank you very, very much. Peter, for it was a this great time. pleasure. It was very, very short, I thought. <laughs> I don't, everybody's gone. It may have felt away to you. <laughs> uh, I just want to very quickly ask you what's, what's next for you. Oh, next there's a there's a... Oh, there's a hush hush project. Okay, next. so we can't well, talk next, about that. Next is Slab Boys at the Citizens. Right. And Coon McBride at the Tron studio. And we just opened Three Sisters at the Tron, which is coming to the Kings. Okay. And uh, it's wonderful work in there. So you just keep going and going and going. I, I will indeed, Peter. And I hope you will forever. Forever, forever more. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,
Thank you. 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 Thank you.